actually start off with the basics of mass spectrometry. And what this is really intended to do is to lay the foundation of proteomics. What's different between analyzing protein data versus genomics data? Like where do our values actually come from? So hopefully um, this will be informative and will really help lay that foundation for the rest of this workshop. So I probably should get rid of my Slack on this computer for the moment. Or yeah, I, just, before you jump in there, Stephanie, I just wanted to remind people, um, Stephanie is want you guys to ask questions as we go along. So if you've got that, that's why we're trying to, if you want to raise your hand, drop something in the chat, just speak out if, 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 you, if we're going too fast or there's, there's a part there that you don't understand. Uh, she's already granted me permission to tell you to do that. So just uh, don't be shy. Yes, please ask questions or this might be really boring. <laughs> all right, display. I'm gonna get all these uh, screens here set up. The wonderful world of Zoom. I do want to also remind you that we are going to record these sessions uh, as they're outlined here for the basics of mass spectrometry, uh, overview of the TMT, those sorts of things. But we will not be recording the discussion and the Q&A. So just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to kind of launch in. Can everybody see the screen? A thumbs up? Down? No? Okay, so yes. we're just starting with kind of what is the proteome, and it really depends on um, different people's experimental design, what they're wanting to do, what time do you collect your cells, uh, what's happening in those populations when you're getting your protein lysate. So your proteome is defined as the time and cell-specific protein complement of the genome. So this can encompass all proteins that are expressed in a cell at a certain time, including isoforms, post-translational modifications. So the, there's a life cycle of a protein where you have the polypeptides that are formed, they form 3D structures. Those structures can then be post-translationally modified to have a phosphorylation sites, any number of different phosphorylation events to do their function within the cell. And when a protein's damaged or it's completed its task, then it's ubiquitinated to break down back into the amino acid components and it's cycled back through. So most of your proteins are 10 to 100 copies per cell, and but then there are some proteins that have 10,000 to a million copies per cell. And what that really leads to is this issue of dynamic range. So your dynamic range is a ratio between your smallest and largest possible values of a variable quantity. This comes to play, it really affects if you're doing any blood serum type projects because in your serum, you have serum albumin, which really takes over the majority of the range of all the abundance of proteins in that sample. So if you're trying to do some biomarker study with serum samples, you're going to mostly if you took that entire population of proteins, you would mostly sequence albumin. So there are certain sample prep steps that we want to account for in order to really target and focus in on these lower abundant proteins in this uh, population of proteins. So we do have this, um, it's just a, something to consider depending on what sample type you're starting with, what is the, uh, population of proteins that are present in that sample, what is your ultimate goal? Are you really interested in the top abundant proteins or do you want to get to the transcription factor and some of those lower abundant proteins that are doing some function in the cell? So understanding a little bit more of the biology of your experiments up front will really help tailor what methods we can do in mass spec to get us the best data. So we've got different protein detection. Um, SDS page gel is what we used to use a lot to uh, clear out old buffers and stuff that are not mass spec compatible. You can do a Kamasi stain and actually see like the total, a lot of the proteins that are present in samples. Um, Western blots are still kind of used for validation of mass spec data, but it's less sensitive than mass spec. 
And so we actually now have more of a targeted mass spectrometry workflow that you can use for validation as opposed to having to use gels and Western blots. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But the basics of a proteome is to remember, we're not actually sequencing amino acids. We're taking a protein mixture. Uh, you can separate that protein mixture to, to kind of separate them a little bit more and then digesting the proteins into peptides. And it's the peptides that are then analyzed in the mass spectrometer. And then we use these database search algorithms to figure out what the identification is of that peptide. So it, it's different from genomics where you can actually sequence the bases. Here, we're actually looking or taking a protein, digesting it into pieces, and then trying to match some spectra to a database in order to do identification. So the basic components of a mass spectrometer is you have an ion source, which will take your, um, your peptides that have been digested, we ionize them with the ion source in order to get a charge onto the peptides. Those ch charged peptides then are in a vacuum system with the electrical field in order to fly through the, the tube of the mass spectrometer to a detector, and then the detector detects how much signal is there and gives us a, a spectra. It's kind of very oversimplified version of mass spec. <laughs> Um, so the other thing to point out is that we're actually looking at a mass to charge ratio. We're not analyzing a specific amino acid. It's a mass to charge ratio. So the smaller that the peptide is, the faster it's going to fly through to hit the detector and in your spectra, your smaller peptides will be listed those intensities first, followed by a larger peptide. So the MALD is what I kind of started with when I was doing proteomics years ago. Um, here you're using a matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization technique where you can literally take your protein sample and put it into a, a matrix that crystallizes that sample onto this little um, chip. And then a laser beam would actually is the ionization source that adds the charge to that particle. And then it shoots through a time of flight tube to a detector and detects the mass, mass to charge. There are a lot more, um, our instruments are way better than that now. Now we're using um, electrospray ionization. We're at the front end of the mass spectrometer. We're actually using a liquid chromatography column so that you can separate those peptides over longer distances in order to detect more peptides and get more protein identifications. So you can separate out the mixture as it feeds it into the mass spectrometer slowly instead of just feeding it a fire hose of peptides and expecting it to try to analyze all that data. So it comes off this liquid chromatography column and in this little section here for the electrospray, this is actually all open to the air within the laboratory. So you wanna have a very clean lab area for this particular component. Um, all those particles get charged with the ion source. The um, solvent starts to evaporate off and it becomes these smaller, smaller little um, droplets into where they explode into their analyte ions. And then those ions are sucked into the mass spectrometer for the analysis. So we kind of have two different workflows that we do in proteomics. We have our um, pre-data collection, just the consultation. What is your ultimate goal? What biological questions are we trying to answer? What tissues are we starting with? We have the discovery phase proteomics, which is mostly what we do here at UAMS. And then we have a targeted validation approach with our partner, Mike Kinter in Oklahoma. So with the discovery phase, we're really trying to, um, we have smaller sample sizes at tens of samples, and we wanna identify as many proteins as possible in those, those samples and do our analysis. Um, for the targeted approach, it's more, it's kind of the opposite. You have more samples and you're really focused on a subset of proteins to get very high quantitative information for those proteins that you want to validate. And then at the end, we do a post-consult with the people to understand the data. <laughs> 
So the discovery phase, I always have to kind of remind myself that um, there's a lot of challenges to analyzing proteomics data. And so we got to remember it's discovery and that there's going to be some false positives in the data that comes out at the end. And we'll always have to go back to the biology and validate it in some other way to put that in context with the rest of the research that people are doing. So the, we have um, several different workflows um, and we kind of make these very flexible because again, we depending on what sample types we're dealing with, if it's mouse, human, some other random organism or whether it's tissue versus uh, cells, cell lines, all of those different factors, you have kind of variable buffer systems and different ways that we've got to take care of the sample prep side. So we really try to make our pipelines flexible to accommodate a lot of different sample types and experiments. So one of the older ways that we did a lot was SDS page um, fractionation using gels. We don't really do that hardly any anymore. Um, we've got better methods now with the filtered assisted trips and digestion. There's uh, labeling techniques that you can utilize for multiplexing samples. Uh, we have more fractionation that you can do to increase the depths of sequencing, um, various mass spectrometers for certain pipelines. So th that's where your pre-consultation at the very beginning of a project is really, really important. Okay, so uh, in gel trips and digestion, here if we had a sample, we would, um, each of the lanes is an individual sample. Um, we used to do this a lot with pull down experiments, then you could kind of see where the IgG bands are. And hopefully um, if your protein's not the same size of the IgG, you could get rid of that and sequence the rest of the gel. But unfortunately, a lot of proteins are like the same size of IgG, so it doesn't always help. Um, but this would kind of reduce any um, buffers that are incompatible with mass spec like SDS, a lot of the detergents. But we do have uh, better methods for this now. Uh, but what we would do to do the fractionation is um, we have this two, minute, two millimeter band gel um, ladder here, and we'd actually cut that gel lane into those 12 or 24 different pieces in order to increase our fractionation of all those proteins and feed those slower into the mass spectrometer so it can actually sequence a lot more proteins as we go. So the other method, um, oh yeah, one of your major disadvantages with gels is you never get all the proteins out of a gel band. When you're doing an in gel trips and digestion, you digest it into pieces within the gel band, but you're not gonna get all of that back out. To, so you'll have a high sample loss if we do gel approach. So we've moved on to more of the um, fil filter assisted trips and digestion where you can actually do your um, digestion on a column and this prevents the sample loss. It is a more difficult sample prep, but you don't have to worry about that. And we have the sample folks here that really help run all these protocols for our samples. And then we also have a um, offline fractionation, which will again, separate it just like we did here with the gels. Now we actually just do it in an offline fractionation experiment. And then that goes into the LCMS. MS. So SILAC was a um, way of multiplexing samples um, before, but it's, it's limited to how many isotopes we can do. Um, so you can have a carbon-13 added into your experiment, which will make it a heavy carbon compared to a light carbon. And then you can differentiate between a light peptide versus a heavy peptide to do quantitation between a, say, a wild type versus a treated experiment. Uh, the disadvantage with SILAC labeling is you actually have to incorporate those, those isotopes into the cells as they're growing in the laboratory. So the cells have to grow and then incorporate the heavy isotope, and then we can do our mass spec analysis. So now um, we have these uh, tandem mass tag labeling approaches, which has really become um, one of our standard pipelines that we utilize for uh, multiplexing. This example is showing just the first um, six flex where you have six different um, reporter isobaric labels that can be 
attached to peptides. So the advantage of this one is you don't actually have to have cells growing to incorporate the label. We actually label it after we've got the proteins and we digest them into peptides. Then we can label peptides from one sample with one label, the second sample, another label. And once you have all of your samples labeled with their individual tag, we pull those together and then we perform the mass spec on that multiplexed sample. So this really helps with your quantitation because now all of the um, peptides for each of the samples are in the same mass spectra and you get quantitative data all in the same scan and cuts down on a lot of the instrument variability. So the overall TMT experimental workflow, like I said, we take our peptides, or the proteins, digest those into peptides, we label them for each of the samples with their isobaric label. Um, we also do an offline fractionation to increase our depth of proteins that we can identify. That first um, run through the mass spec is going to give you the abundance of that peptide intensity, which is your MS1. And so that spectra will have all 10 samples included in that same scan. Then the MS2 is when you take the um, peptide and we send it into the Orbi trap and then you hit it with some gas, it breaks apart the amino acids and we get an MS2 spectra. MS2 spectra is what gives us the peptide identification. That's how we identify the amino acids, what that peptide sequence is. Additionally, with TMT, each of those um, pet, uh, peaks, they have a um, the TMT isobaric tags associated with them. So then we do a, a second fragmentation to break off the TMT reporter ions, and that gives you your intensity values for all 10 samples. And this is where the quantitation information comes from for a TMT experiment. So a TMT um, tag, it consists of kind of three different components. You have this um, mass reporter. The mass reporter is what's uh, separating these different tags, the 126, 127, all those different um, isobaric labels. You have a mass normalizer so that at the very beginning when we're labeling our peptides, these tags all have the same molecular weight. So the difference is, is after you break off the MS3 at the second cleavable linker, that's where you're starting to get your differences between the 10 tags. So at the very beginning stage, the abundance of the peptide, the sequence, that's for all 10 samples, that's all in one spectra. And then in this MS3 is where you get the intensities for the individual samples. That's where it's demultiplexed. Does that make sense, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so the mean reactive group, this tag is gonna be associated with the N-terminus and it also binds to lysines in the peptides. So I'll go over a lot more of the data and stuff and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense as we go throughout the workshop. So once we get data coming off of the mass spectrometer, that raw data then has to go through a database search algorithm in order to identify the peptide sequences and what proteins those come from. So two of the main tools that we use is Mascot and MaxQuant. Uh, Max, Mascot is a commercial, you have to have a license to run their database search. Um, it, and I found that that one works really well for PTMs. If you're trying to search for modifications, I tend to use Mascot for a lot of those. Uh, MaxQuant is really a powerhouse. Um, they've got a lot of there's a lot of utility with MaxQuant, and so that tends to be the one that I, I utilize the most. They also have a YouTube channel, and I put the link here in the slide. So if you want to know anything more about MaxQuant, all their parameters and settings, they have lots and lots of videos that will explain it all. Um, they have a MaxQuant summer school. That's, um, you can really, you can learn a lot about MaxQuant, and I'm sure I'm I don't know as much as I would like to know. Um, so once we do the database search, that's what provides us the information. We also upload all of that data into a scaffold file. So scaffold is a free, they have a free viewer 
that allow you to see your list of proteins and then also the, um, the protein sequence. So I do have some examples of what that file looks like, how to look at it, um, and I'll, I'll show one of those later. Um, it's super helpful, especially when you're first just kind of looking through the data. Okay, just as a quick example between, I talked about gel CMS approaches. This is a, a million cells with the myeloma cell lysate, and we separate it on a four to 12% gradient gel and cut it into 20 different sections. And then we did mass spec on that. That'll give us almost 7,000 proteins identified from those cell populations. If and then when you look at the abundance, the protein abundance for those 7,000, you'll see histones, ribosomes, all of those proteins are the really high abundant proteins identified. And um, you start seeing NRAS, but if you're trying to get to TET2 and KRAS, um, those are your lower abundant proteins. And so that the deeper we can sequence and get more proteins, the more you'll start picking up those really interesting transcription factors that are related to the disease. So it, if you have a, an idea of what your abundance is of the proteome that you're dealing with in your biological experiment, um, that'll really help us to know how much do I need to fractionate or how deep do we need to really sequence in order to see those interesting targets. This is kind of that dynamic range part that we were talking about at the very beginning. So if we do a similar, taking some melanoma cell lysates, another million cells, 12 fractions, and do a multi-notch TMT approach, then we got a, we added another 1400 proteins or so to our protein depth information. So the, we're able to do that now where instead of doing one sample at a time, you can actually multiplex 10 samples together and get quantitative value for all 10 samples and do your comparisons in a more quantitative way. So always, always, you know, for all of us bioinformaticians, we want to talk about experimental designs, hopefully before people start their experiments and start prepping samples in the lab. Uh, you want to know number of replicates. With If you're using a TMT approach, you're really kind of limited to a five by five study. If you try to go um, more than that and you have to go across multiple batches, that becomes a problem. And I'll show you that here in a little bit. Um, protein modifications, if you're interested in uh, phosphorylation modifications, those are really low abundant PTMs. And so there's other enrichment protocols that we need to do in order to detect those modifications. So it really, um, you have to ask a lot of questions. What's the ultimate goal of this project? Um, what are we trying to do in order to determine the workflow that we need to do for the mass spec? The quantitation methods, so we have label free, we have the SILAC labeling approaches, TMT, and one that I don't have on here is now the data independent acquisition. I'll talk about that one as well. And um, so there's various quantitative methods. And this is where it comes really, um, and why I'm going over this for this bioinformatic workshop, understanding how those samples are prepped at the beginning, where those values are coming from, really helps you to interpret missing values um, in other batch effects, that sort of thing when we're doing the analysis. So it's really important to know, am I dealing with count data? Am I dealing with intensity data? Uh, where's the data coming from? And how do I interpret that at the end? Um, so, yeah. And I some have, of the- uh, Stephanie? Yeah. I, I, we have a question here and I just may not be a place for you to talk about it right now, but uh, Joseph wanted to know if we're gonna be focusing on any open source software today or so, programs with a paid subscription? The software that we have, we actually um, published the Proteo Viz that has a lot of this in it. So I have access to that on our GitHub. There's a couple of tools there and I'll show you some of that analysis. We'll go into FOSFA stuff a little bit more tomorrow. Now I actually show a lot more of the data stuff tomorrow, but um, yeah, I can point you to some, some tools. Okay, thank you. And that is actually something that I would love to have come out of this meeting is um, there's not a lot of 
freeware on proteomics for some of the challenges that we face. So this would be an awesome opportunity for us to hopefully build a little network and we could tackle some of these challenges, make some new tools and you know maybe get a publication out of that. I'd love for that to happen. So just message me if anybody is interested in anything like that. I would love to work with you. Okay. Um, and again, I always just try to tell people, let's you know talk to the person who's going to help you analyze your data at the very beginning. So everybody, you can design it properly. Okay. So um, yeah, a little bit more here. I'm going to kind of show how this process works in a little bit more detail. So if you have your, your protein population, uh, we digest it with trypsin is mostly what we utilize. Um, that'll give you the peptides. We we'll go through this LC column to really fractionate out the sample. So you're not just hitting it with a fire hose of sample at the same time. Um, that'll allow you to spread them out and really um, sequence deeper. Then it goes through the selector spray ionization here at the front end of the instrument. And then the um, peptides are sucked into the instrument. The first MS1, this is going to be the um, abundance of those ions that hit the detector. Then um, in data dependent acquisition, it's going to select the top 20 of those most abundant um, peptides for fragmentation. Those top 20 peptides will then go into the um, MS2 sequence. Um, let's see, do I have a, I had a laser pointer here somewhere, but I think I've lost all my stuff. I'll find it later. Um, but the MS2 is the one that's going to give you the, um, you take those peaks that are found in that MS2 spectra and you subtract them. So you subtract the, the master charge values in order to identify the amino acid. Every amino acid has a particular master charge value. And so that's how you're actually getting your sequence. Uh, come on. There we go. So one of the first things that we do in the, um, sample preparation, we also want to make sure that we don't have um, polypeptides that are interacting and sticking together. So we want to have individual peptides in order to analyze those. So we use a reducing agent, um, TCEP, DTT, to break apart the polypeptides and we alkylate any of the, um, at the um, cysteine bonds. So you alkylate with iodoacetamide in order to prevent disulfide bridges from forming so that you can keep all of the peptides as single peptides and analyze this. Uh, this is important when you're doing your database search because you have to include that modification in the database search parameters in order to detect those peptides. So always good to know. And the same thing with like a, a histone, if we're trying to look at post-translational -mod post modifications on histones, Histones have a lot of lysines and arginines, which is where trypsin cuts. And if um, we do another type of chemical modification where you can put a heavy acetylation onto the lysines of a histone, and then that way it can skip those different, or actually it's arginine, um, I don't remember right now. Uh, anyway, um, in order to try to get longer peptides so that we can actually identify PTMs. But that's, that's where I'm saying, like for the analysis side of it, you do kind of need to know what happened to all the samples up, up front in order to set the correct parameters and get the right data. So trypsin is our most commonly used protease. It cleaves on the C terminal side of basic residues, arginines and lysines, unless there's a proline. Um, it's active near neutral pH, all that good stuff. Um, there are other proteases, so, depending on what your, how many lysines and arginines may be present in a protein sequence, um, we can look at using other proteases that um, will cleave in different residues. So um, we have had to use some other types of proteases just depending on the samples that we're, we're working with. The most time it's trypsin. So this is an example of a triptych digestion of a BSA just a control sample. And you can see all of the peptides here that are in red, those would be um, mass spec compatible or triptych peptides 
where trypsin is going to cut and cleave. And so there is a particular molecular weight range of peptides that the instrument is able to actually detect. So I'm here it's showing from 146 to 2,435 molecular weight. Um, and there's another algorithm for IBAC normalization. They do a theoretical digestion, it has to have six amino acids to 30 amino acids is kind of the range of that cutoff algorithm. So with that, you're not gonna detect the entire protein in these, these experiments. You get um, certain peptides of that full protein is, and there you're gonna have gaps in your sequence coverage of those proteins. Um, this also brings up the point of longer, if you have a longer protein, it has the potential of detecting more peptides than a shorter protein. So it's, you're kind of already biasing towards those larger proteins when you're um, doing the detection. Another um, fun challenge with proteomics data, some of these peptides are the exact same in various proteins. So you can detect a peptide that's shared across multiple other proteins, and there's no way of determining which protein that particular peptide comes from. So one of the things that our database search algorithm tries to look for are unique peptides that match to a particular protein in that database search. And so you wanna, um, that way you have confidence that we have identified that particular protein. So this is the uh, looking at the retention time over the column as it's coming off of the LC column, just using a 30 minute uh, gradient. And you can see like certain peptides have different um, chemical properties. And so they come off at the different um, gradients of acetonitrile throughout time. And the more here, you got more peptides coming. So most of our runs were using about a um, hour gradient, I think in order to slowly release the peptides off the LC column and then run it. And then they get, they flow into the mass spectrometer. So this MS scan is the first MS scan that's gonna determine the mass of the intact peptide. As you can see here, we've got several peaks that are above this uh, kind of background noise. Those most intense peaks are the ones that are gonna be selected for fragmentation to get that peptide sequence. And so then we take those into an MS2. And now this is the spectra that we use to get the actual sequence information. Um, yeah, we'll go. So MS fragmentation, we're using collision induced peptide fragmentation um, and it occur occurs at peptide bonds. So when it breaks, uh, hit it with a gas, it'll break it across the bonds. And the way that we get it, we'll get uh, B ions and Y ions. A B ion, the charge is retained on the N terminal fragment, Y ion, the charge is on the other side on the C terminal fragment. So it's just really breaking the bond and determining which side that charge is determines whether it's a B series or a Y series. And that's important because uh, that determines the directionality of the peptide sequence. So if it's a B, B on series, then you start from the N term to the C term and you're reading the, the sequence N to C. Y on is gonna be backwards. So it's K, S, S, and I, and so forth. So you, you can get the, uh, the sequence from both directions. And um, Scaffold will do a good job of showing you the actual MS2 spectra within the viewer. So then you can see how intense those Y and B ion series are and determine if does this look like it was a good spectra for that particular sequence or were there some gaps within this sequence and it was unable to really determine what one of the amino acids was in the middle of the sequence. Um, you'll notice in this one, I also have a C plus 57. That's the iodoacetamide treatment that they did in the sample prep. So we have to include that 57 um, molecular weight in order to detect the peptide sequence. And that's simply by keeping those disulfide bridges from, from forming. Okay, so then we've got the uh, TMT, which I've already covered. So just a little bit more about the tags. 
in order to do the multiplexing, they, it's really pretty creative. So what they did is at that cleavable marker, and they just started moving the charge onto the mass reporter and changing that mass by one Dalton or one Thompson. And so each of these 126, 127, what they're doing is they're just moving the charge from the mass normalizer over to the mass reporter region. And then that separates those uh, values by one in the in the MS3 spectra. And then we can determine the differences in the samples. So you can do that for, um, we can have a um, 10 plex kits now. There is a 16 plex, but I think 10 X, 10 plex actually works better. So at the end of this, uh, fragmentation of all the peptides, all of the tags are going to be down here in that low level uh, 126, 127 Dalton range. And so it's outside of the noise of all the larger fragments. And it gives you really good quantitative data if you can keep all of your samples within one batch of reporter ions. Right. So yeah, of how many can we do? Um, the 10 plex works well. There is a 16 plex that will work. Um, it doesn't ionize quite as well as the 10 plex ones do, but we can go up to a 16 plex. And what they did is in, on the um, 10 plex is they added these where it's on the N terminal versus a C terminal. So their instrument is very highly resolute so that it can actually distinguish between a 127.126 versus a 127.13 and to determine the differences in those tags of those samples. Okay, so there's a, I'm not gonna go into this in like huge detail. This is more of a, for your information of the sample prep side. Um, our core does a lot of work trying to make sure that um, when we're taking 10 different multiplex samples and then you're pipetting those into a pooled sample, we're trying to eliminate some of the mixing errors of, so that your quantitation differences are based on the samples, not based on the fact that we loaded more of sample two versus sample one. So what they actually do is they'll take um, all 10 samples that are, are tagged and mix them one to one to one to one to one to one, how many ones, and then <laughs> run that on the mass spectrometer and get a quantitation using the mass spec. So not, not like a BCA assay or any of those protein quants, but we're actually using the mass spec to quantitate the ratios of each of those samples. And then we can normalize those values and pipette the right mixture to get kind of that, so that nice pooled sample of all the 10 samples together. So the more work that they do on the sample prep side really helps us with the analysis side a lot. Um, so this ratio check here, using the mass spec is what they're utilizing to really combine all those samples and give us good quality data to, to work with. Um, yeah. So one of the key issues that came up with uh, TMT experiments is batching. It's a very, very strong batch effects when you have more than one TMT set of experiment or samples. So we have done some randomizing of the samples across batches and try to kind of use that randomized design in order to try to overcome some of the uh, batching. It helps, but it's still not great. So if I was going to do one that has more than 10 samples, I'd probably want to try to use the newer DIA approaches instead of TMTs, because you, you're just, it's really hard to break a batch effect. Uh, we do try to use this pool sample too that kind of helps with the technical side to see how the analysis is affecting a pool sample. So a pool sample has a, a pool of all 20 samples that you have or however many you have. Um, I guess it'd be 18 if we did nine and nine and then the pool. So that will um, give you a representation of all the peptides and all of the samples that's consistent across both batches. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to give that mass spectrometer, here's all our abundant peptides that are coming off. I want you to select those abundant peptides 
and get and try to eliminate some of the missing values in one batch from the other batch. It, um, it does help, but again, that is one technical issue that we have with the analysis is dealing with these major batch effects. So then we uh, do an offline basic pH peptide fractionation. Uh, they're just using basic phase and then on the LC column, it's an acidic phase separation. So you're just, you're separating out the peptides to get as many peptides identified as we can. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you've got all of, all of the different retention times and you can see um, in each of those fractionations, we've got more and more peptides that are coming off of the instrument and uh, increasing our depth. Okay, so we have done some testing on just uh, how many fractionations can we do? How does that impact the number of, pep uh, number of proteins that we identify? Um, if we throw more instrument hours at it, do we also increase our depth of sequencing? So with six fractions and seven hours of time, uh, we get about 7,000 proteins. If we do 12 fractions at 13 hours of time, that increases to you know, 8,800. With 36 fractions, you get about 10,000 proteins and costs a lot more time. But at some, some point, it just starts to kind of plateau to where more fractionation and more sequencing is not really gonna provide that much more uh, protein coverage. So it, it kind of hits this point of we've maxed out what we can get for samples. And a lot of that's important to know because uh, time is money. <laughs> the more instrument hours we throw at stuff, the more it costs. Okay. Um, 